so sort of so um just to just to provide a, a little bit of context we've spoken about this in the past in previous webinars currently globally we're capturing around 40 million tons of co2 per annum um, the iea uh, estimate we need to increase that by a factor of 20 uh, by 2030 and more like a factor of 100 by um, 2050 so this you know carbon capture and storage is something which we have to have and it has to grow at a, a massive uh, rate i think most of us on the call we're familiar with the oil and gas industry um, we can kind of understand the business model for, for the oil and gas industry. There's a commodity uh, which has an intrinsic value, and so long as we can find it in sufficient quantities and get it safely uh, from the subsurface to the market uh, in a cost-effective way, we can make money. Um, for CO2, you know, it's a waste product, if you like, from uh, in industry, you know, things like iron, cement, um, and, and power. So as such, it doesn't have the same intrinsic value as oil and gas. Um, so although you know, the, the products which industry make do have intrinsic value, but there seems to me a need to understand how something without that intrinsic value can be uh, you can create a business model and a regulatory framework uh, around, around that. Um, so we've got the perfect panel of speakers tonight, and I'll, I'll introduce them in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, but before I do that, if I can get to make a, a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, we're going to do a, a poll in a moment, um, uh, a Mentimeter poll. Uh, then we'll get into the moderated panel session uh, and we'll allow some time at the end, uh, 20 minutes or so for audience Q&A, which Alison is going to host. So use the chat box to um, uh, send in your questions. Audience cameras will be muted. Um, and as I mentioned before, the session will be recorded. Just a quick word on some upcoming events. Uh, so we've got uh, the next session in April, Alison's Isherwood, uh, the chair of our Net Zero Committee is hosting it. And that's around oil and gas social license to operate. And we'll stick with oil and gas theme in, in May. I'm hosting something on offshore electrification. And then we're hoping in June to revert back to uh, a CCUS uh, session. Uh, Max Richards from APC is going to be putting something together, probably around the well integrity reservoir and flow assurance. Um, more on all of those to follow. And if you do have any specific ideas of things you want us to put on, uh, you've got my email address there. So we're going to try uh, a bit of audience participation. Um, so we've got a I want to assess the audience, how ready is the UK for CCUS? So there's a Mentimeter poll and you can either scan this QR code or go to www.menti.com and enter this code. Uh, and we will, I've, I've split the question into, you know, how ready are we from a technology and engineering perspective, but also from a, a business models and regulatory environment perspective. Um, so hopefully you've got uh, that you're on there now and you can start putting your votes in. Uh, I don't know whether they promise you can just make a note of that code. So, because what I think I'll do now whilst you're voting is just introduce the speakers and then after i've introduced them i'll come back to the results of that poll um 
Right, so the speakers first up will be um, Anthony Miller, uh, head of CCOS Transport and Storage Delivery at Bayes. Um, uh, and they're developing the CCOS Transport and Storage Regulatory Model, which he'll talk about. Prior to joining Bayes, Anthony was with uh, Centrica Storage uh, for seven years, and, and prior to that with Ofgem. Uh, and he holds a master's in economics from the University of Melbourne. Um, Chris Ghent is policy manager at CCSA. Uh, he works with the members there to promote and support the development of commercial CCUS industry in the UK and Europe. Uh, and that's focusing on the emerging CCUS policy framework, engaging with industry, government, and wider CCUS stakeholders. And in the past, he has worked for, for the BGS on offshore CO2 storage sites. Then finally, Ronnie Quinn is CEO of Nexus. Um, it's a membership organization supporting and representing members through the challenge of industrial decarbonization, um, primarily through carbon capture and hydrogen. And, and Nexus has a Scottish focus, so it'll be uh, great for, uh, Ronnie to bring that angle in. Um, prior to that, he's worked in the electricity markets, which is uh, very relevant, as well as the Crown Estate, and was uh, the first chief executive of uh, the Crown Estate in Scotland. Um, so hopefully, everyone has voted. I need to just get up the results. Uh, yeah, we've had 31 people voting, so I need to just Stop sharing that and go into sharing. Right. Are you seeing? Yes. The results. Great. So, according to the audience, our audience feel that we are quite well prepared in terms of technology and air engineering skills, but in terms of the business models and regulatory environments, not so well prepared. So I'll be very interested to hear whether our speakers agree with that assessment. And uh, it'd be nice, I don't think we'll have time, but it'd be interesting to see if uh, the audience change their view over the course of the session. So I think, that was me done, so I need to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Anthony as our first uh, speaker. So a bit of an intro from, from Anthony, then Chris. Okay. Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just, can you see my slides all right there? I've just, uh, we can, they're not in presentation mode. Presentation mode now. There we go. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, so thanks. Thanks everyone. And, and it's a real pleasure to, to be with you this evening. Obviously, uh, I've got my, my work cut out for me, given the response for the, um, uh, the, the, the poll, uh, Hopefully uh, the business models, I think there's a lot of work to do, but hopefully they're a little bit more advanced than, uh, than a two out of five rating. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I'm from Bayes. Um, I've been in this role for about a year now. Principally, I'm trying to deliver the um, transport and storage, storage regulatory investment model. Um, we'll go through that in a little bit more detail, but that's what we call a, you know, a regulated asset uh, value based model. Um, which is common to a lot across a lot of uh, industries and a lot of the things that we're that we um, well use in all you know in all facets of our life, um, but uh, applying it to a you know a brand new market um, in this way is is a, a really ambitious and, and quite significant goal. So um, I'll start to go through my the rest of my presentation. Um, I am from government and as such, I have to put a disclaimer on practically everything I say. 
uh, you'd appreciate, or hopefully you'll appreciate that all our, our business models are still under review and they'll have to go through, um, a, you know, a number of clearance processes before that they actually uh, get put into place. So, um, yeah, in the in the documents that you may well have seen already and, and even in this discussion, what I'm presenting is that, you know, sort of our mind are two positions, um, but uh, some of these positions are likely to change. And similarly with, with the, uh, uh, any of the comments I put forward in the discussion, um, they're based on the model as it is, but we've got, uh, you know, a fair way to go and uh, they may well change. Uh, so I think hopefully this is pretty naughty stuff for everyone here. Um, you know, basically what we're looking at is a, you know, uh, the transport, well, uh, CCUS basically involves a whole bunch of different industries looking to capture CO2 and then they're going to put it on a pipeline, you know, on a pipeline network and pump it into underground storage. Um, obviously within that too, there's scope for whether it's pipeline storage or non-pipeline, um, you know, sort of storage as uh, or non pipeline transportation. Um, principally, at the moment, I just say that you know the the cluster approach that we've we've uh, sort of taken um, in the first stage. We're very much focused on the sort of pipeline connections and domestic um, uh, CO two sort of capture and storage. Um, you know, obviously, as the models develop, we will need to incorporate non pipeline transportation transportation, whether it's ship, road or rail, um, and, uh, and also consider the, 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 you know, the scope that the UK has for international in, uh, imports of, of CO2. But I, I won't really be touching on the, the non-pipeline elements today. Uh, I think, as was also mentioned, um, the scale of uh, CCUS in the UK, or the, the ambition is absolutely huge. Um, you know, sort of, uh, I think it's now up to 30, 30 megatons by, um, by 2030. Uh, and also, you know, with, with different targets within that for industrial, uh, you know, in, industrial uh, uh, carbon capture and, um, you know, uh, uh, capture from, from power production. Uh, so... So getting a bit more into the uh, transport and storage regulatory investment model itself, um, when, we're when, when we've been designing this, uh, our, our primary goals are that we want to attract investment, right? So, um, you know, government is obviously, uh, they're supporting this, this model, but, but what we really want is this to be delivered by, by industry. Uh, and you know, and, you know, provide good investment signal so so it can be delivered. Um, obviously, we're we're trying to enable low cost decarbonisation. So, uh, you know, we need to, you know, sort of develop this network so it's it's got scope to grow and and um, you know allow for for you know future users of the network. Um, and as the chart before sort of demonstrated, we're expecting this model to accommodate all the, the transport and storage network to accommodate carbon capture across a range of different um, uh, technology types. And, uh, you know, on that chart before we didn't capture other things that we're expecting to work into the model, such as, you know, BECs and DACs and other things that, um, you know, we expect to be able, you know, these networks to be able to, to accommodate. Um, and uh, and we've also what we're, I guess we're also trying to sort of keep a, a mindful eye on is how this market might develop and change over time. You know, the, the size of the network, the interconnectedness, the role of, of non-pipeline transportation, the role of, um, of, of CO2 imports, etc. Um, uh, but again, we've got to do all this within the context of, of ensuring that it's uh, that we're getting sufficient adaptability while, while also managing the, the sort of value for money. Uh, sort of elements of, of getting this this new market off the ground and this new infrastructure sort of in place and up and running. So I think what you know what what's pretty clear is you know particularly you know this for for uh, you know sort of on the offshore elements of this um, the approach to 
the, the well the regulated asset approach is is quite different i guess to generally how you know sort of oil and gas infrastructure has been sort of delivered in the past um and part of the reason why we think that the the regulated asset model is important is um well like a lot of investment here it does in, in you know include a high cap you know high upfront capital costs um and at the moment you know against what is quite uncertain um i guess uncertain demand and uh, and you know and and also you know this stuff hasn't been tested at scale yet you know the asset is, itself have long operational life and um you know the network can you know can and should be built out in a sort of modular way um uh, you know, customers are, are sort of seeking physical capacity, uh, but you know, I think all that's pretty common to any oil and oil and gas sort of infrastructure project. I think what's you know a little bit more important here is uh, we don't want duplication of the infrastructure, particularly onshore, and um, uh, also too, there's there's a, a probably a greater challenges around the fact that um, you know. Because it's, you know, because you don't want this duplicated sort of infrastructure, there's there's more risk that as a, a single operator of the of the network capacity that there's scope for sort of um, higher costs or monopoly pricing, lower quality service or or other sort of anti-competitive behaviours. So you know, restricting access or you know, misusing commercially sensitive information, those sorts of things. So. You know what? What does that actually mean in practice? Um, well, you know, um, regulated asset models. You, you need a, an independent economic regulator, and um, through uh, different consultations, etc., we've we've come to the view that Ofgem is the best placed uh, entity to to deliver economic regulation for this network. Uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, what does the what does the model do itself? Well, you know, you want uh, you want to see that the investment is made efficiently. So the costs are you know the costs that are being incurred and chargebacks to users are efficient, and that you're you know meeting a set of um, uh, you know performance uh, indicators. So that's you know generally how the model works. Um, the other thing that a regulated model do does is it is it it offers um, uh, you know, a certainty of, of return over the over the long term. So uh, it does, you know. So so in some senses, there's well, there is reduced risk uh, for for um, the investor. Uh, but uh, but you know, on that side, you know, because because you're you know under the regulator model, risk the risk that the um, uh, the investor is taking is reduced. Uh, the, you know, the, you have greater protections, and there's limits on how much of a return you can uh, you can generate. Uh, I think the the key thing that will come through in a couple in, in the next slide is is one of the the key protections that that we have under this model is protection against the sort of demand side risk. So, you know, if the demand for the network doesn't you know isn't there, uh, and obviously as we'll touch on in a second through Chris's presentation. Uh, in these early phases, there is a need for government to sort of support those emitters to join the network. Um, where that demand isn't there, we've sort of proposed measures that will ensure that the TNSCO um, you know, gets its allowed revenue. So, uh, so you know, I think in yeah. The, the tri-model itself all probably revolves around the concept of the allowed revenue. And there are different sort of facets to, you know, facets to the allowed revenue. But in effect, you know, we put the formula there. So I don't, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but the allowed uh, revenue broadly includes the return on capital. So that, that includes your, what, what's deemed as your, uh, you know, efficient investment in the infrastructure. So your efficient capital costs. Uh, times by the the WAC, the weighted average cost of capital. So um, taking into account, you know, you know, sort of return on on uh, on equity and return on debt, plus depreciation of your assets, uh, your opex allowance, your your decom provisions, uh, your in uh, tax and and other adjustments, which can include things like your 
you know, performance, you know, performance against your incentives, uh, et cetera, and other sort of pass-throughs. Um, so uh, the different facets of the model, as we've sort of set them out, is you've got the uh, the ERR, right? And that, again, is is what actually sets that the size of that, that allowed revenue uh, pot. Um, so that's really where we stay out. What are the assets that we, or, you know, what are the outputs that we want the TNSCO to deliver, right? And how do we want them to deliver it? And what's that, you know, what, what's the balance of risk that we're asking the, the TNSCO to take in delivering that infrastructure? You've got the, the sort of the tariff model, which ultimately what we want is, you know, so, so um, you know, the, the TNSCO will be, Collecting its its allowed revenue through a set of fees and charges, which are you know which are which the users of the network will pay. Um, in general, we want those those charges to be uh, cost reflective. Um, but equally, in these early years, there you know there may be scope, or there, there will be mutualization of other things. We may allow the the charges to increase up to a up to a, a sort of a capped amount that we've. Noted as uh, should be aligned to the, the carbon price, um, and then uh, and, we, and sorry, just to say, we are working through what the exact structure of the of those fees and charges should be, and and, and you know the, the split between you know the sort of capacity component and the and the, the sort of well, commodity unit, the the, the volumetric charge, uh, and then you've got the revenue model, and um, this is sort of the this is the safeguards that we have in place to ensure that the, the, the TNSCO uh, can get its allowed revenue and, and you know, manages some of the, 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 the demand side risks that we talked about. And uh, if you look at the business model update, um, you know, a few of the risks that we've highlighted are um, utilisation buildup. So when there aren't enough users on the network to be able to sort of use enough of the capacity so the fees don't meet the, um, the allowed revenue amount. You've got underutilization, so that would occur if you know users drop off the network or you know don't use the network as much as they forecast their their usage of the network should be. Uh, you've got timing mismatch, which is associated with when that first user joins the network, and under this model, the TNSCO doesn't start collecting um, allowed revenues until the asset's commercially operational. You can't be commercially operational until you have CO two on the network. Uh, and uh, and there's some other allowances for, for sort of bad debt. I think they're the, the main ones off the top of my head, but um, uh, yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, um, if the if if user fees don't meet the allowed revenue, there's a revenue support agreement that we've proposed, and that you know sort of is a payment to the TNSCO, which um, will either come from government or consumers to, to make sure they get their allowed revenue amount for each given year. Um, if, uh, and then we've also proposed another safety net. Um, so, uh, and that's uh, the, the government support package, right? And that will step in uh, if there's, um, a, you know, a, a leakage event, um, which, or, or a, basically the, 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 you know, the physical storage infrastructure is not, you know, you can't inject uh, CO2 into it. So basically if the, if the network sort of fails uh, because you don't have, you don't have storage, then the GSP um, will pay up to the value of the RAV. Uh, and the other side of that is also the stranded asset risk. So what if the users never show up or, you know, there aren't enough users to actually sort of, uh, to meet the allowed revenues over a sustained period of time, there could be a point at which government says, "Well, actually, uh, you know, um, it's not worth continuing to pay these top-up payments. We prefer to pay out the value of the rate." So that's sort of the key components of the model. And then, uh, in relation to timing, um, or you know, so I think it's 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 worth just understanding, um, you know, the, the, some of the different components of the model. And obviously, we've got uh, the legislative regime. So we do, we will require legislation to, um, you know, put the um, 
uh, this model into place. You know, it's just things like the, you know, sort of uh, providing off-chain with the right regulatory powers and you know other other components of the network, such as the you know special administration regime and um, you know other other um, aspects associated with DCOM uh, funding requirements, etc. So so that requires legislation. Uh, then you've got your supporting agreements that we've, we've touched on. Um, so GSP, RSA, you know, the, you know, uh, other aspects of the DCOM regime. Uh, and then there's the actual, the, the, what I sort of suggest is the guts of the model, and that's the relationship between the government and the, um, or, you know, the, the economic licence, as I said, which sets out the inputs that you're, and, uh, uh, that you require from the TNS code. You've got the code, the network code, which again, I'm not sure how many of you will be familiar with, with concepts of network codes, but that in effect is the rules that govern the relationship between the emitters and the TNS code. And it will set out things like, you know, how charging arrangements work, how disputes work, um, how, you know, network constraints work, you know, how, how you allocate the network, um, you know, in, in different scenarios. And then you've got, you know, you sort of you, your connection agreements and construction agreements, etc. So they're the sort of big components of the model. Um, and then in terms of of, of timing, uh, hopefully some of you may have seen our business model update and uh, other consultation responses that were were published in January. Uh, over the first over the first half of this year, we're, we're actually um, getting we're doing more engagement with industry and and the selected uh, clusters in particular to develop the, the business model in more detail. Um, so we're also uh, developing the, the network, uh, developing the network codes, um, again, with, with, with industry, CSA and, and, and some of the TNS codes on the business model teams. Um, in the second half of the year, we'll publish an update on where we are with the license, you know, sort of draft uh, license and uh, draft heads of terms for the, the network codes um, that will allow us to engage in, in further industry feedback and development of those documents. Uh, and we, we will sort of kick off negotiations on the back of those draft documents. Uh, in the first half of, of uh, next year, we'd like to sort of finalise the licences and these documents so that we can sort of go through the necessary government and uh, clearance processes as well as, you know, industry clearance processes um, to be able to sort of get to, to FID by, by half two of, um, of, of 2023. And then with, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, operations, et cetera. So hopefully commencing in uh, from 2024 onwards. So, Hopefully, as I said, I can't see anyone. Um, hopefully that all made sense, but I think I'm handing over. Now, is that right, Barney? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a brilliant uh, setting of the scene there. Thanks, Anthony. And um, yeah, there, yeah we, we've understandably focused on the transport and storage side of things because you know, that's where a lot of the oil and gas skill sets lie. But it's, it's so important to put it into context and how the emitters um, uh, feed into it and so on. So I think, Chris, you're going to tell us something about that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Barney. Yeah, let me just uh, share my uh, screen a moment. Uh, so please let me know when you can see it at full screen. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, sort of following on from, from Anthony's uh, comprehensive um, overview of the transport and storage elements, I'm just going to dive quickly more into the, the emitters perspective. So what do, what do the, I call them emitters, but in the future, obviously, they're CO2 producers that will be storing CO2. So uh, from a CO2 producer's perspective, what, what does a business model entail um, uh, uh, and what, what are they looking for as part of the suite of business models needed to, to kick the whole value chain, not just the not just the pipeline and storage element, but the, 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 the users and the, um, and the storers. Um, so not, I don't have a disclaimer, but I have a, a quick, uh, quick overview of who the CCSA are. So we're a trade association representing the carbon capture and storage sector. Um, we 
we do advocacy typical trade association activities um and I've, this slide's more for reference if, if you want to follow through and go onto our website then uh, i recommend you have a have a look on there about what we do um i don't think i need to dwell too much on this uh Anthony's slide has, has some quite nice pictures on, but I guess the, the, the image on the right here it, it is, is a cluster model, lots of different industries and lots of different objectives for those industries. What, what do they need um, in terms of a business model to, to make this investable and, and, and actually uh, protect them from, from some of the international markets that they're exposed to as well as a carbon price? So this slide here, um, it's quite a busy one, so uh, apologies. This is from uh, the, the GCCSI, the Global CCS Institute, and it's uh, one part of their very good annual report, and it shows some of the projects which are operation and, and looking to move forwards. And, and I, I guess I can draw your attention to the column on the left, which has all of the different potential, well, the different currently considered applications of CCS. I think this, this graph is ever changing, ever being updated. And I think if you look at the UK, you can almost have as many projects here uh, on this chart just in the UK. Um, so it's, it's really changing quite quickly. Um, but just to, yeah, as I say, the, the column on the left has lots of different central applications through industry, power production, hydrogen, direct air capture. So as I say, each one of these industries will have their own um, decarbonization pathways and their own different costs and, and, and considerations that need to be addressed in a, in a business model. Um, Barney's already sort of ran through this in terms of where we need to go and where we need to be. Uh, and just to, to note that this is from the IEA report and the, the graph shows quite nicely that this is split across many different industries and, and they will change over time. But um, I think, you know, as we, as we look at, at, at the models, we need to understand you know, where, where these industries are and, 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 and particularly how they change and, and what we expect the, the nth of a kind from, for, to use that term project to look compared to the first of a kind project. So um, sort of a, quite a basic slide, but uh, I think it, it's quite, ha quite interesting just to, to think about what a, a good business model looks like from an, a, an emitter's perspective as well. You know, it needs to be, as I say, a framework, I'll start on the right, a framework that evolves over time towards an nth of a kind project. It, it can handle the, the ownership and, and liabilities of the CO2 and, and has clear responsibilities in it. Yeah, it be relatively simple and, and, and understandable and, and replicable if possible has to protect industry from some of the wider um, uh, carbon leakage potential, so moving the industry offshore. Uh, there is the whole piece on cross-chain liabilities and risks, which Anthony sort of ran through, particularly from a TNS perspective, but again, the vice versa, it has to protect the CO2 producers if the network is unavailable. Um, it has to be relatively long-term and, and, and attract the private finance to, to help deploy the projects and be compatible with, with wider industrial and palm policies and also be able to provide a, a, a return or at least, um, as I say, be able to, to make sure that the industries remain competitive in an international market. Um, so I, I guess we, we, we looked at TNS and, and that's one sort of model and, and there are lots of different industries. And in the UK, obviously, Bayes have, have got several teams working away at this and they've split this into, into power industry uh, and then also looking at hydrogen and, and greenhouse gas removals, as, and they all have their own uh, models associated with them. So lots, has, lots is actually happening, and there's an awful lot to, to sort of read up on if, if you're so inclined to understand the emitters models. But just quickly on the, the, the power model, this is a, a dispatchable power model, which is, is primarily focused at flexible gas generation uh, and ensuring that they, uh, with CCS, that that can, can deploy uh, at, at the right times uh, and also provide sort of availability and capacity payments on a contract for difference model. So um, uh, just a, a, a handful of um, points here on the left, but I'll leave those for people to run through in their own time because I think the conversation that we're going to have and, and the panel discussion will be uh, quite valuable. But that's they're quite a well-advanced model. Again, we, 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 we anticipate that to be finalised this year and, and, and um, I think that one's very well advanced. Uh, the industrial carbon capture contract. So this is um, a carbon contract for difference. So it's a CFD type model. And the idea here is that um, the, uh, there is a price for deploying the technology and there's a reference price, which is effectively the price of a trajectory based on the price of carbon. So the difference between deploying the technology and, and paying the, what would be the, the alternative price of carbon 
um, is a payment between the government and the emitter um, to, to help deploy the technology. And the idea is that over time, as the, the carbon price increases and, and the market emerges, then there's less of a role for, for government to, to support some of these industries to help deploy, deploy the technology. Um, again, for, for early projects, these are going to be bilaterally negotiated with, with government and, um, uh, and they, they provide a 10 to 15 year uh, contract, depending on uh, some various conditions within that, that, that um, negotiation. Uh, this is quite an interesting model based on, on the previous slide. It's, it's, it's providing carbon capture as a service. So this idea is that you have one company who, who goes around to various uh, emitter companies or CO2 producers, should we say, and, and says, you know, I'll, I'll capture your CO2 uh, as a service. And they, they get paid a, you know, a, a price for that. And then they have the agreement with the transport and storage company. Um, it's quite an interesting model. And, and I know Anthony focused a lot on the, the pipeline uh, discussion, but obviously this, this model it, it kind of works quite well for, for, for sources of CO2, particularly from medium and smaller emitters and, and, and those around coastlines and some of the smaller industrial regions that um, perhaps can't have the economies of scale from large emissions that a pipeline network can, can introduce. So that is an interesting model, which is also being considered at the moment. Uh, I've popped in hydrogen here. This is, again, this is a slightly uh, a difficult one because at the moment the government are trying to de define a model which works for both blue and green. And, and obviously um, each, each of those production methods has its own uh, objectives and, and, and costs and, and, um, uh, and nuance, uh, shall we say. Uh, but again, it's, it's a similar type of CFD model, uh, which uses the, the, the gas, natural gas prices, I guess, as a floor. Um, and then there's a subsidy which, which supports the difference between producing hydrogen and the effects of the alternative, which would, in most cases would be natural gas. Um, and there's still some work to do to, to figure out how, how the volume, the early volume risk is, is being considered. So uh, you're producing hydrogen and there's no off-takers. What, what does that look like from an industry and government perspective? Um, and then there's also some conversations about how to uh, introduce mechanisms to increase that sales price to effectively reduce the size of the subsidy from government's perspective and also potentially reward the, uh, the companies for actually achieving a price above the reference price, which is natural gas. Um, and, then, and then finally, I, I guess I'd just draw attention to another sort of type of model around greenhouse gas removals. Um, so there's, this is probably one of the models which, which requires more sort of concerted effort over this year to, to bring to the, the same level as some of the other models. Um, and effectively, it's, it's how do you reward the removal of CO2? Um, and that has to map across various applications in terms of either just directly from the air or, or via bioenergy, um, either used in industry or particularly in power. Um, so, you know, we expect there to be a, a direct payment initially, but obviously there are mechanisms such as the emissions trading scheme, which will provide a, a pathway uh, to have a market led approach. And obviously, there are companies like Microsoft and, and companies are looking at the, the buying, buying on removals um, and it makes it needs to make sure that the model can work for, for voluntary involvement in that sector. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, I realize I've sort of blasted through that. There are some additional slides in the pack as well that you, you may wish to review as, um, uh, after the session, but I'm looking forward to this. Uh, thanks, Chris. That was a really, uh, really valuable bit of context you put there. And it, it shows the complexity of this in a way that there's so many different uh, business models for the different uh, industrial streams and it's all got to, to fit together. So um, thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, so next, our next panelist is Ronnie Quinn. Um, he's not got slides to, to show, but I think he might have some uh, thoughts reflecting on what Anthony and Chris have already said. Uh, plus bringing in you know, his particular perspective uh, from Nexus. Um, so over to you, Ronnie, and then after that, we'll uh, get into a bit of a panel discussion. Thank you very much, Barney, and um, thank you everyone for, for logging on this afternoon. Um, I made a decision very early on not to do some slides, and that decision, I'm glad to say, has been vindicated by the 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 quality of the slides from both Anthony and Chris. There's no way I could um, match those. Um, so 
you will just have to uh, bear with me uh, and listen to the the few the few comments that I that I have. So, as Barney says, I'm Ronnie Quinn. I work at Nexus. It's a membership organisation, a platform, and a mechanism by which information can be shared and transferred between all those interested in industrial decarbonisation in Scotland, whether they're industrial emitters, developers in the supply chain, academics or indeed policymakers. Both Anthony and Chris mentioned some numbers and I think it's important to get back to what it is we're trying to achieve here. And we have two targets that I'm going to mention. The, the UK target is to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And Scotland has an even more ambitious target to achieve net zero by 2045. Um, neither of those targets are going to be easy and they are going to require a galvanization or a galvanizing of industry and, and uh, the policy makers and lawmakers to make this happen. So far as Scotland's concerned, um, what we're we talking about industrial emissions in Scotland uh, for the, the full year to uh, 20 for 2018, the CO2 emitted by industrial emissions was just under 12 million tons, 11.9 million tons per annum. The top 10 industrial emitters emitted 7.8 million tons per annum. The CCC has said that carbon capture and storage is non-optional. The Scottish Cabinet Secretary for Energy and Climate Change has said that CCUS is mission critical for Scotland if it's going to meet that 2045 target. And I'll go into that in a little bit of, of depth later on. But the UK government has committed to having two CCS clusters deployed by mid-2020s, with four CCS clusters deployed by 2030. And the targets are five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen by 2030, and six million tonnes of CO2 from industrial emissions by 2030, and nine million tonnes by 2035. So 6 million tonnes of CO2 by 2030 um, is a lot more than we have at present, but people may ask whether that's ambitious enough, given that the uh, CCC has said this is non-optional and this is something we need to do. So I, I'm going to now reference the cluster sequencing guidance issued by Bayes um, in November 2021, which in turn references the net zero strategy from Westminster. And, and they've set up an industrial decarbonisation and hydrogen support scheme. The SNAPLE uh, abbreviation is IDHRS. And that will fund uh, from 2023 up to one and a half gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen and a funding envelope will open in 2022 to deliver up to 3 million tonnes of CO2 per annum by the mid 2020s. Just take a moment to think back to what those targets are. Subject to costs falling. The government is also committed to further allocation rounds of the uh, support mechanism for all types of eligible low carbon hydrogen and industrial carbon capture from 2025. I can't improve upon what Anthony, Anthony's side set out for what do investors need? They need a degree of certainty as to price and length of contract. They need a balance of risk and they need a line of sight to the market. 
I am struck by the parallels that we're facing just now um, with offshore wind and the challenges that offshore wind faced, what, about 15 years ago? And the game changer there was scale, deployment, and experience. We are now world leading in offshore wind. We are not currently world leading in carbon capture and storage. If we're going to get to there, we need to think about that scale. We need to think about deploying and we need to think about developing that expertise and that experience that will help drive costs down. Costs won't be driven down unless we start. We need to make that start now, um, and we need to make progress in putting these, in reaching these targets, because they are challenging, and we're only going to meet them if we can start now and start um, learning and start putting projects out at scale. Um, much of the infrastructure that's needed and, and much of the, the investment that's needed is going to require patient capital. It's going to require boards to make FID decisions that are going to be there and haunt them for the next 10 to 15 years. They need some assurance uh, before they make these decisions. As Anthony says, much of the investment is going to come from the private sector, but they need, do need some assurance that uh, they will have line of sight to a market, they will have a degree of certainty as to the price and the return on their capital, uh, and that that is going to be fair. It's only with those preconditions will we be able to drive down the price and uh, deploy at the scale necessary for us to meet those targets. With that, I'll thank you and I'll hand back to uh, Barney and Alison. Thank you. Great. That's brilliant, Ronnie. Thank you. And I, you sort of um, came across loud and clear the, the urgency of this um, and the importance of, of really making those investment decisions easier for the investors by giving that line of sight on um, where the revenue is coming from and the the um, some of the things which Anthony was talking about around the the guarantees for for what happens if things don't go quite according to plan. So thanks very much for that. Um, if uh, the three panelists can come back off, uh, put their videos on and and take their mics off, I think we'll get into some panel. Q&A. Um, so initially some questions from me for probably 15, 20 minutes. Um, I'm a, do keep audience questions coming in because I want to leave sort of 20 minutes or so uh, at the end uh, to cover those questions. Um, so yes, thank you very much. The um, My first question is really sort of trying to understand how the models work. I think the, you know, Anthony, you laid out a, a good sort of clear explanation on the transport and storage model. You know, if we can get some good estimates on the capital costs and the operating costs, then there is a, a, a return on uh, based around um, a, a percentage on top of that. Um, so the transport and storage company would be charging the emitters what can you can you talk through the the carrots and sticks for the emitters to uh, persuade them that they want to put in the um, their their CO two into the transport and storage company? Uh, sorry, the 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 sort of um, carrots and sticks for the emitters. Uh, that's probably not my that's not my strength. Maybe Chris wants to jump in on that one. But it, you know, in effect. Um, you know, obviously, the you know the key carrot is ultimately to be avoiding uh, having to sort of pay the ETS costs associated with you know emitting this this uh, emitting the CO two, uh, and obviously, you know, we expect the the CO two price to be 
you know, sort of increasing. It's now at sort of, what is it, odd 90, you know, 90 pounds a ton or something like that. Is it, is it sort of around that? Um, which is starting to bring the sort of overall capture and storage into the market. I think, you know, depending on the technology and stuff, there's still a little way to go though. Um, on the, you know, on, on the TNS side, uh, what are we trying to invent, you know, incentivize? Ultimately, we want the network to be there when emitters need to use it and with enough capacity to sort of accommodate sort of growth and expansion of the, of, of the number of capture, um, or, you know, the uh, people capturing CO2. Hmm. But, uh, Chris, Chris do, you, do you want to come in there? Yeah, no, I, I, I think Anthony sort of laid the groundwork there for my answer pretty much. But uh, yeah, it's, it's the rising carbon price. But I think it's it, it also has to be put in the context of, of the, their international markets that they're in. So it has to be supported by some wider policy pieces around you know, procurement in terms of procurement policies or, or labeling. So people can say these are decarbonized products and we'll pay you a premium for these. So, so it, it's, it's CCS is part of a suite of decarbonization particularly for industry who, who are, are exposed to some, some of the international markets. And, and at the end of the day, um, you know, producing product A more expensive in, this, in Europe versus in, in a cheaper region um, for some companies is a no-brainer. So that, that we really need to be conscious of carbon leakage and, and making sure that the models and policies ensure that companies are producing things in the right way and, and protected against some of those international elements. Ultimately, the carbon price is, is a key driver. It has to be supported by the other elements that are also in development. And I guess there's an assumption there that the carbon price sort of keeps on going up is, I don't know, is, uh, is, is that a fair assumption? Uh, Ronnie, do you, want to, do you want to come in there and sort of give, give your angle and you know, what's, what's incentivizing the emitters? You're still on mute. Yeah, so I think Anthony spoke quite well about the, um, or very well about the, 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 the TNS element, but the other side that, that Chris mentioned is incredibly important, that ongoing level of support for the operation of the assets, for, for the uh, payback of the fairly hefty kit that has to be uh, bought and, and installed for, for many of the industrial emitters, that, that's, a, that's a big decision um, and, and that has to be taken at board level and people will need to understand what the ongoing level of support is going to be for both the, CC, the carbon uh, mitigated but also uh, the, the byproduct, the, the hydrogen that's going to be emitted as well. And I think it's important to understand that boards will have an option here. Um, they, they can decide that it's going to be too expensive to cease trading. And that's when the, any thought of a fair and just transition to a low carbon economy starts to go out the window because we need to keep people engaged. We need, need to keep the economy and industry working and mitigating carbon at source is going to be a key way going forward that the UK economy can uh, transition to a low carbon economy and keep the lights on and keep the economy and keep uh, jobs. Uh, it's, it's not, as the CCC said, this isn't optional, this is something we have to do. Uh, absolutely, we have to do it. Um, and so sort of touching on, on something you said there, Ronnie, and also Chris, um, it's, it's, you know, the, there's costs to be, you know, this isn't cheap to do. You know, there's the costs of the, the transport and storage system and those are passed on to the emitters, but then the emitters have costs to do the, the capturing. You, know, you talked about products being more expensive, being premium products, but that's going to be passed on presumably to the consumer. So 
sort of is that where the ultimate cost is borne by the consumer is there a a tax element which is 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 going to come in and and if people are seeing their costs rise how do you keep them on board that this is something they are uh, they're happy to participate in uh, so i guess probably a couple of couple of points um <laughs> on this one i think I think that you know, there are there are cost increases, as you say, and, and part of the, the business model with design is to reduce that, that sort of exposure and um, to, to those. And obviously the carbon price, we assume increasing over time uh, is, is, is a mechanism to, 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 to move away from that. Um, I think that, that there is a misconception to some extent that the costs will result in, in massive increases. Uh, I think there's some interesting studies done on uh, iron and steel, for example, which is often cited as one of the more expensive CCS applications. But if you have low carbon steel from CCS on a car, it would increase the price by 500 pounds. You know, it, it's not, you know, in terms of the price of the car, that's not massive. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the units at the end of the, the chain, sometimes it, it's a lot lower than people anticipate. But, a lot of these companies already operate on such tight margins that, that any additional costs are can be quite challenging for them to to to, to, to compete with, particularly fertilizer and cement, for example, which are competing with much lower um, units in in Russia and and, and China, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so it it's it does increase a bit, but there are ways around that, and and part of the wider policy is to protect that. And there are conversations around carbon border adjustment mechanisms as well, which are, are potentially a tool to to help um, with some of those decisions. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm aware we, we sort of not got a whole lot of time and I do want to get round to audience questions. So perhaps sort of changing tack a little bit around the um, you know, access for the emitters you know, the, to the transport and storage system. My understanding there could be quite different types of emitters. So you can get uh, you know, power from gas. Um, sometimes they're going to be wanting to use, say you've got a four megaton per annum system. Sometimes they want to be using as much of that as they can when demand for gas power is high. But when the sun is shining and the wind's blowing, uh, renewables take up that. So, you know, they're, they're usage is going to be quite variable compared to perhaps something like blue hydrogen or cement. So uh, it's probably Anthony's best place to, to talk through. How, how do you manage that vari variation in what the um, emitters are supplying? And, and will all emitters be paying this, this, the same pound per tonne? Well, it depends, right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, we want to have, or you know, part of the RAV model is you want the network to be able to sort of manage the, you know, the sort of amount of CO2 you want to get on there. It should be, you know, in those optimization and design questions, we need to factor in, you know, how much spare capacity, how is it going to operate and, and, and handle different sort of, you know, flow rates from different users and, and how do we make sure there's sufficient, you know, baseline flows. And as you said, if, if um, you know, the, the network you need to design if you've got six power stations on it is quite different in terms of the amount of peak capacity you have to sort of manage if you've got, uh, you know, just purely industrial emitters. So, um, you know, partly that's the, so under a regulated model, right, the the, the uh, TNS code would foot forward its development plans, explain why they're building the network in such a way and, you know, and demonstrating that the the investment they want to make is efficient to accommodate sort of demand. Um, in terms of the, the actual tariff structure is uh, we're, we're working through that at the moment. Uh, you know, in general, the way these sorts of models work is the, the you know, the, the unit price for capacity is going to be the same. Um, and, you know, and the volumetric charge will be the same for any user. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, how they have to book capacity and how that feeds through into, uh, you know, well, so, uh, you know, in a model where you, if you have a power user that has to 
have a lot of available ca capacity for longer, that means that the network needs to be bigger to accommodate those people. So potentially they need to pay more through their, their fees and charges uh, because they're requiring the asset to be bigger. So we're working through that process as to um, how, how the charging structure works. It's a little bit different to, I think, the model probably you have in your head or perhaps others do, which, you know, if it was just based on a sort of take or pay based on your, your volumetric throughput. Now, that may well still be the model, the, the tariff charge, the charging structure we go with, but classically in economics, you tend to focus more on the, the sort of linking it back to the, um, uh, the cost of the capacity that needs to be built to accommodate that, all issues we're working through. So I don't know whether that helped or just confused things. I think it helps, but by the sounds of it, that means that sometimes the capacity won't be fully utilised if, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, there is a, you know, there, there will be a case where there may be, you know, uh, well, yeah, unused capacity. But ideally, we want to get to a point where you are at, you know, high levels of utilisation. Yeah. Yeah, Ronnie. Thank, thanks, Ronnie. Um, Anthony, if I may, um, query whether or not the, well, in simple terms, the length of the pipeline will, will have an impact on the cost, because I'm, I'm thinking here, um, primarily about the, the feed of 10 pipeline in, in Scotland going up from um, yeah. the Grangemouth area up to up to St Fergus and uh, hoping that because you know the, currently that, that's the only route to decarbonize the central belt in Scotland and, and hoping that there's no excessive penalty envisaged there uh, because of the length of that pipeline? Well, you know, again, we need to look at these things, right? So at the moment, in the model as it's been proposed, we haven't sort of proposed a, a, a distance charge, right? But we need to, you know, you know it, but that is going to depend on the, the actual choice of network. It, uh, what you could have, though, is obviously the, you know, you know the, classically what the, we're proposing a postage stamp model in general, right? Uh, which means that it doesn't matter where you are, you're paying the same entry exit fee. However, we need to look at that in the context where you might have, um, you know, very different parts of the network and whether it's your, you know, whether it's this, the Scottish model where you've got, you know, one set of emitters which are effectively on the beach, right, right next to, you know, on the same plant as the, as the terminal. Obviously, the, uh, you know, the costs, you know, the capital costs associated with those emitters is quite different to someone at the end of, of, of fee to 10 and whether or not, you know, we need to have sort of some form of differentiation. Similarly, in the, the sort of East Coast cluster, you know, the, the you know, the, the way the, the network's potentially going to be structured on the south of the Humber is quite different to the, the sort of Teesside sort of component, you know, and, and you know, gaseous versus dense space, et cetera. So as we get into the details of the charging structure, we need to sort of, you know, examine some of those differences um, and make sure again that the, the charging arrangements are efficient and incentivizing the right behaviors as well, ultimately, because uh, I think as we've touched on, obviously at the moment, we expect most or most users to be CFD backed, but at some point we want people to be joining this, uh, you know, without the need for, for government support. So they've got to have, we've got to sort of make sure that the, the right signals are, are sort of being baked into how we set up some of these structures now. But it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it feels like it's, the, it's always a balance between trying to get as much CO2 into the pipelines and, and finding the right um, business models which make it attractive to um, the transport and storage company. Um, OK, I, I, last question from me before we pop to some uh, audience questions. And again, it's a slight change of um, tack around and now more on the storage side. It, it's sort of, and it's possibly a regulatory thing as much as a business model. Who gets to decide when the, the CO2 is, is properly stored? Is there some sort of threshold as to, you know, no molecules will leave the ground or 90 percent confidence that 99 percent is, is stored and and if there is leakage of any sort you know what 
you know, is there a threshold at which operations get shut down and the uh, emitters can't access the transport and storage pipelines? I'm I, I'm going to caveat everything I say here in that I am not the expert on this, and these are sort of really great questions for the OGA. <laughs> um, but you know, so so in effect, you know, the OGA isn't going to grant a storage permit unless it's you know confident that you know any risk of leakage is remote, right? So there should not be any leakage from the ground, and uh, you know, the, you know, obviously there'll be monitoring for the the pipeline infrastructure. Um, and then, you know, we expect that, but, you know, so it's got to, it's got to go in the ground and they've got to be confident that it's going to be permanently stored. Right. And then at the end of the store's life, there will be, you know, uh, there is, there has to be at least 20 years of post, um, uh, sort of, you know, post closure monitoring as well. Right. So, um, and again, even if leakage occurs, you know, if, if leakage starts to occur after that, then it's not necessary that the permit will be uh, terminated. Again, I'm not great on the terminology here, but um, the risk of leakage should be, you know, it has to be remote. Otherwise, this is not a, a viable sort of thing to do. If, however, you know, things do happen, and we touched on it in my slide, so there may be, you know, earthquakes or other geographical faults and, you know, uh, some of that could be within the, you know, um, and again, in the business model, we talk a bit about, you know, sort of fault and, and non-fault, but, you know, hopefully in almost all these cases, it's a, a non-fault issue. But if, you know, the decision is taken that the, so the GSP kicks in, if there is a leakage, right, from the store, then the GSP kicks in. There's something called the supplementary compensation uh, agreement, right, and you know, that, that sort of kicks in if commercial insurances can't and, uh, you know, sort of offers the capacity to do rectification work. But if it can't be rectified, right, and there's no confidence that CO2 is going to continue to be stored in that site, then the GSP kicks in and you get back the value of the RAV, you know, yeah. subject to some adjustments. Ronnie, Chris, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, Ronnie? Thanks, Barney. Uh, and yeah, don't disagree with anything Anthony said there. And it does raise in my mind um, one of the issues that, that's a, a bugbear of mine, and that's the utilisation of the seabed, because there, there's an assumption that there's room for everything. Uh, there's room for oil and gas, there's room for uh, carbon storage, and there's room for offshore wind. And particularly, as Anthony says, once you, once you start monitoring uh, storage sites for CCS, um, there's no plan worked out yet as to how you do that if there's an offshore wind project there or, or other infrastructure there. So we, we as a, a nation are going to have to start thinking about how we, how we manage that um, spatial uh, coexistence, if you like, uh, and what what do we prioritise or what what do we zone for what areas? Because assuming that the sea is empty isn't just you know it's just factually wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. I think uh, this is Chris. Did you uh, want to come in at all, or or should we go over to audience? Yeah, I, I've just said uh, to perhaps say a few few words. Um, mm -hmm. I think first and foremost, it's it's in it, the, the, the permits and the, the regulations are in, in legislation as the, the CO2 storage, um, uh, what, as well as known as CO2 storage directive, which was developed in Europe a, a long time ago, which, which it gives the OGA, under, underpins the OGA's permitting decisions. So you know, the, there is a framework there um, and you know, it hasn't been tested yet in the UK, but you know, that it, it does exist and it has quite strict uh, rules and, and, and on the, so the, the monitoring and the handover and, and things like that. So we're not starting from scratch on, on, on that point. And, and obviously there's been some really good work done in particularly in the Sleipner field in Norway for, for many, many years monitoring the, the plumes and, and obviously other sites around the world. So this isn't, you know, monitoring stuff isn't new. I think Ronnie's point is very interesting. Monitoring these things in a wind farm is, is completely uh, untested and, and, you know, toad streamers through a wind farm is, is it, it does, raise questions. Um, 
those questions are being asked now. So, you know, there is a lot of work going on about the, some of these co-location things. Um, uh, and you know, th there is a very good, you know, offshore um, framework in place. And I, I see that, um, that Anthony's um, put in the chat some, some, some helpful references for people to sort of look into some of the conversations which are currently active. So, um, yeah, just to remind people to take a look. And, and in terms of so the SBE expertise, you know, seabed nodes and, and some of the, the offshore sort of monitoring and understanding seismic reflectors and, and the, uh, the, the subset is, is, is a really important part of the development of the industry and novel technology. So um, there, there, are, there are things to be done and, and places to look. So, um, yeah. Great. OK, Alison, do you want to uh, come in and, and share some audience questions? Sure, yeah. Um... I think the first one that came in is a good one to start with um, from Adrian Gregory on, on you've kind of shown us the complexity of this with the different business models, not just for the um, transport and storage, but also for the industrial players, uh, power and hydrogen. And do you think those business models are critical path? Do you think they're going to delay um, the plan for, for, for bringing CCS on by 2025 for two clusters and then four for 2030? Uh, who wants to start? Uh, Ronnie, do you want to? Um, the short answer is yes, they are on the critical path. Um, that's not to say they won't, uh, they won't come forward, but until those uh, business models are in place, it's going to be very difficult for boards to reach it, you know, FID decisions. So yes, they are on the critical path. Um, and if there are delays, it will delay uh, deployments. Okay. Does anyone have an idea which bit they think is is most critical here? That's that's going to take the longest time out of these different business models. Anthony or Chris? Well, look, hydrogen is one that's that's sort of uh, is, is probably tracking a little bit behind the other the other sort of three. Um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the role of hydrogen for different potential networks is also different as well. So it's, uh, you know, it's not to say that it, it will be necessarily be the hold up for all investment or at least getting this off the ground. But certainly uh, I would agree that um, certainly for a number of the, of the networks and for long term growth and expectations around this, uh, that the hydrogen business, business model is very important. Um, and maybe I can jump in there as well. The, the greenhouse gas removal model is again is 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 one that is in need of of, of further development. But, and I think it's 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 important to note that we're not going to get this perfect straight out the but straight out the gate. There there is a a, a degree of, of evolution of these models and refinement as as we test them. So um, I think there is uh, there is an ur you know an urgency both from industry and government to, to move things forward and 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 the recognition that the things will 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 change over time. So um, I think that's important to remember. Okay, yeah, I think that kind of links, and you made the point a couple of times about having to stay aligned with with other countries and. Um, and make sure our system works within that. Someone's actually um, given a question here. David Talon asks um, for Anthony, can you please share with us some of the risk analysis for non-UK situations? For example, can UK CO2 production go to an overseas storage and can non-UK CO2 bid for UK storage? So I think um, there's no reason why, well, there are reasons why, uh, UK <laughs> captured CO2 at the moment can't go overseas and, and vice versa and there's there's a few agreements so there's work on London Protocol and there's some other regulatory sort of issues that we're trying to work through to sort of allow that sort of international trade of, of, of CO2 to go to different stores so um, uh, you know again not my area of expertise um, but you know we're certainly not seeking to limit those sorts of options and potentially uh, you know, in the longer run, there's a resilience factor there as well with that, that sort of things like international shipping can provide both um, for shoring up sort of, to, you know, the, the, the viability of the commercial model for, for domestic storage and also to sort of manage, um, you know, sort of issues of outage and constraint potentially if, if those arise on, on the UK network. Um, but there is a little bit of work to do. And similarly, you know, and, and Chris is probably the best person to, 
you know, sort of comment here at the moment. Um, primarily with, with bandwidth, like at the moment, the business models, are, as I said, are focusing on, on the uh, pipeline storage, but we're certainly seeking to allow, you know, in the way in which we're structuring things, we want to make sure that they're consistent with allowing, you know, different models of, of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, shipped gas to, to sort of access the networks. Um, but at the moment, we're waiting on those business models to, to develop a little bit to, you know, and, you know, have a, a, the option that we need to work into the, these networks. But, uh, but yeah, no, Chris, I don't know whether you want to comment any more on the, the non-pipeline aspect of it. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I, I say, a few, <laughs> say a few words. And I think, yeah, as Anthony said, the, the focus is very much on uh, the, the, the networks, getting the first stores up and running, because without those, you're not going to have anywhere to put your ships here to. Um, uh, but obviously, the, the, the shipping can play a, a big role, both internationally and, and domestically. Um, like Antti said, the London Protocol is one area that uh, there is a framework in place that needs to be sort of worked through the, to allow the sort of cross-border movement of CO2. Uh, additional complexity of, of the role of the Brexit and, and how the EU and the UK interact with their emissions trading schemes and moving CO2 between the, the two jurisdictions, but, but they're not unsurmountable challenges. So there are a lot of companies really interested in, in particularly in the shipping question um, and the options that can provide and the resilience piece is a really important one. So, you know, if there's a maintenance needed on the store or if there's some, some unforeseen circumstances, there are options. Um, and I think that's a really important one to remember. So I'll pause down. I know Ronnie may have some questions on this because I know that the, the, the Scottish cluster are, are very interested in this discussion. You're on mute, Ronnie. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. No. There is a there is an issue about uh, the compatibility with the, the current arrangements and that Anthony hinted at that already with um, shipping in of CO2. I, there's, no, there's no real secret here that the, the Scottish cluster in particular were very keen to include in their bid uh, for the cluster sequencing uh, competition from Bayes, the ability to ship in CO2 from elsewhere in the UK, but also from uh, further afield. Uh, and the uh, storage facilities that we have in the UK and, and in the North Sea in particular are, are genuinely world-class. And it's going to take us hundreds of years to, to fill them up. Um, and, and we have the ability, we have the capability and arguably, uh, the more CO2 we can inject uh, and store uh, makes the price cheaper for everyone involved, uh, as well as having the um, ecological benefits associated with it. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, there's, there's a point here that I think is interesting. We, we talked a bit about whether you know, prices would ultimately be transferred to the consumer. But there's kind of a wider question here about whether the public will accept CCS and um, who, you know, the public often perceive this kind of activity as the oil and gas industry pleasing itself rather than a genuine contribution to decarbonisation. This is from Bill Wilkes. Just, um, is, is, is that likely to be a spanner in, in the works? Is this something that we that is on the critical path to get public acceptance of it? Or will we be on that? Ronnie, go ahead. Yeah, if I can kick off uh, and then perhaps um, Chris can follow up. But I, I think there is, there is some way to go here uh, to uh, inform, work with the public to let them know that this is, this is a way of transitioning to uh, a low carbon economy while preserving the economy, while preserving jobs. Um, it's not a new fancy green initiative, if you like. This is a way of transitioning uh, and, and moving forward into a more sustainable future, but uh, at the same time, keeping industry alive and keeping the economy alive. I think we need to start framing the discussion a lot more about that 
there is obviously an element of taking some of the, the mysticism out of this. And um, I think Chris's uh, slide earlier on showed the, the range of projects throughout the world. And we need to start talking about this, not as some uh, obscure uh, laboratory experiment, but as an industrial process that isn't new, that isn't novel, we're just going to be doing it bigger than anywhere else. Points. I'm happy to, um, uh, Anthony, I just see you've gone off mute, Anthony, if you want to say, say a few words, but well, I'm happy to, happy to yeah, jump. Great. Okay, uh, <laughs> thanks. Now, I, I guess it is a really interesting point and, and we have lessons to learn and, and you know, the, the Peterhead project in Scotland it was a very good example of, of a, a project which got the local public on board and, and the local regions. And you know, I think that, that, that those lessons are, are, are critical to ensuring the projects can, can actually move forward. And, and, and groups, well, I mean, we've referenced the CCC several times now and, and you know, they've done a fantastic job you know, uh, identifying what needs to be done and, and how we need to get there. I think there's a really important role for bodies like the CCC and academic groups and independent groups to really outline the, the need for this technology and engage with the public as, as a sort of a, a trusted and, and scientifically backed um, you know, discussion. Uh, industry are great, but there'll always be a, an element of, of, um, uh, of criticality on, on industry decisions. But the, you know, we, need, we know from the modeling, we know from, from where we need to be and how quickly we need to get there, that CCS is, is, is critical to that pathway. And, and it's not all about the oil and gas sector, it's about jobs, it's about carbon removal as well. It's about taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere to ensure that we can reach next year. So it is a complex, a very complicated, you know, whole chain to sort of digest, but I think there is a really important role that we need to sort of break that down into an understandable and, and relatable um, and, and time critical technology. Uh, yeah, I, I can't add anything on that. So, uh, uh, you know, completely agree. I, obviously, we're, we're as government, we're you know, we, we are sort of looking at and 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 keen to engage on that public perceptions piece, and we see it as an important part of our, our job. And it will come through with legislation and how we frame debates and those sorts of things. And um, but I guess the other, as as Chris sort of touched on, there's well, you know, there's there is a job for industry, you know, the regulators, all of us to do to to sort of make sure that the, the, the underlying message is coming through about, you know, that, that, that Ronnie touched on his, uh, you know, when he was speaking to this issue as well. Okay, thanks guys. Barney, I don't know, I know you had some closing remarks and things. I don't know if there were any, uh, that was most of the questions. You're on mute. On mute, I had to do it at some <laughs> point. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, that's a, a really good uh, you know, set of questions. I, I've got sort of 20 more questions I could ask, but we are running out of time. Um, so I thought it might be nice just to give each of the panellists an opportunity to sort of give us some closing remarks, perhaps around sort of what you're really hoping to come out of 2022 uh, where where do you want to be by the end of 2022 in terms of uh, evolution of the industry ccus and and business models um anyone can jump in and go first well look by the end of 2022 uh hopefully i'm going to have uh on the table a a sort of very good set of uh draft um uh, draft heads of terms on both the uh, uh, the license and the network code, which has allowed us to sort of push ahead with uh, really meaningful negotiation, uh, which will you know sort of put us make sure that we're clearly on that critical path. That's my that's my well, I think that's my my KPIs for the year. So I better I better deliver it. Well, maybe maybe I can jump in next, Ronnie. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think I think for me it's 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 business models across the suite in terms of, you know, the bit more detail on hydrogen, transport and storage, you know, the publication of the industrial and the power and, and progress on the greenhouse gas removal ones at least in that form. But it's also a, a, a strong forward look on terms of, you know, which projects, you know, what are the future phases for application for networks? You know, what the, what, what is track, what does the next phase of cluster development look like? You know, 
how can we really build an industry around the development of these first networks? And by the end of the year, if we can have a bit of sight onto the, 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 the opportunities for industry to, 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 to access, engage, and be funded through the, the, the support mechanism, that would be, uh, that would be my, uh, uh, my wish. Um, and, and I think we, we, it's not a million miles away. I don't think you know, that's, a, that's a hard ask. Thanks. Uh, for, for my part, um, it, it's changing the scenery somewhat because um, when I first started looking at CCS many years ago, it was 10 years away. And it was always 10 years away and 10 years away and 10 years away. By the end of 2022, I'm hoping that we will see the industry is starting and we will be deploying and, and making uh, significant contributions in a couple of years time and by that I mean too mm. we've just got to get on with it as you said yeah. in your opening remarks that's great so uh, it sounds like we should uh, reconvene in january 2023 to see if all your wishes came true that's a good idea yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean there is you know so much which can be discussed on on ccus it is you know we, like I said at the start, we're hoping to have another sort of more technically oriented um, session uh, in June, uh, which uh, Max is going to host. Um, but I guess just from me, thank you to, to Anthony, to Chris and Ronnie uh, for giving up your time. Thanks to the audience for lots of good questions and, uh, and your interest in the subject. And, and thanks also to Alison for uh, handling the Q&A. Um, also, a final thanks to ERCE who have sponsored the, um, the webinar series. Um, so we're just pretty much out of time there. I guess if anyone wants to just stay on for 10 minutes um, to sort of just chat through the chat function, then uh, feel free to do that before we close it down. But um, panelists you've you've given up lots of your time so no obligation for you to to stay on if you don't want to and um, thanks thanks to everyone A anything else from you Alison no I didn't think so same as you I've got at least 15 other questions I could have asked but uh, you've got to leave people wanting more and we'll come we'll reconvene I am sure in a yeah. year's time as you say <laughs> thanks everyone